Kim and Cotis, and we're here in beautiful Grand Haven at the home of Norm and Barbara Spring. Uh, Norm is the founder of the Michigan Seal Headers Association, and Barbara's the author of The Dynamic Great Lakes. And we're going to chat with them for a while and talk about their experiences here in Michigan and also their role in, in working with the community and uh, helping to define how beautiful it is to live here in the Great Lakes. So, Norm, welcome to the show. And uh, tell us a little bit about how the Michigan Seal Headers began and your role in it. Well, Years ago, the, uh, all the fishing in, in Michigan was uh, commercial fishing, and the, uh, everything was uh, geared in that direction. Well, they decided uh, through the Department of Natural Resources to plant salmon, and uh, the, the DNR actually decided that we really need a sport fishing organization, and they sent a, a representative uh, out looking for somebody that could start up a a steelheaders organization, as we we used to have started with that name, and it stuck. But anyhow, we uh, they approached me, and uh, they uh, asked me to um, to get it going. And I said, "Well, you know, I'm awfully busy." But they said, "Well, that's the kind of person we want is somebody that's really busy." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, anyhow, we uh, started a. Um, uh, called a meeting in uh, March of 1967, and uh, this was in uh, Grand Rapids at the museum over there. And we sent out letters to um, a variety of fishermen throughout the state and uh, and let it be known that we were going to have this formation of a, a uh, sport fishing organization to get, try to get it started. Well, 500 people turned out, and... We, uh, uh, that night, we put on a presentation by a, f a friend from uh, California originally. He did some salmon fishing out there, and I think it was Oregon. And uh, he talked about the fishing uh, for salmon in that area and uh, gave a presentation. And then we uh, had an election of officers. And, uh, of course, uh, I, uh, calling the meeting, I was... Uh, elected president and we and then we had a vice president and a and a secretary and, and then we had uh, meetings throughout the state of Michigan we went to different towns to uh, have these different seminars as we called them a salmon seminar and um, we I think there were 17 different communities that we went to uh, every year and We'd have all these uh, uh, people that would uh, attend, and and we had some uh, commercial people that had given away lures and things like that, and we presented it to the the different people. And uh, and after a while, there were chapters started throughout the state of Michigan. I think we ended up with 24 different chapters. I think there are that many yet, and uh, and we kept this organization going. Eventually, I wasn't the president all the time because I was getting tired of that, but uh, I always attended the meetings, and eventually we got an executive uh, director, um, a guy by the name of, um, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but anyhow. So he'll come back. <laughs> anyhow, uh, he, uh, he kept the organization together and, and, and did the... Um, uh, a salmon magazine, uh, Steel Eater Salmon Magazine, and uh, and they got a lot of commercial uh, backing on that, and and that's uh, it's still going strong since 1967, and uh, so we didn't have to have uh, go around to all the different states because we had these different chapters had their own meetings. And from there, it uh, I guess it uh, speaks for itself. Well, you know, we have quite a variety of species of fish here in the Great Lakes and, and our streams, the Muskegon River, the Grand River, the Pier Marquette, the White River, the Black River. I mean, Michigan is a real um, 
fantastic place for fishermen to come. And um, could you tell us a little bit about the different kind of salmon that we have here and uh, some of the fish that your local local folks and the people you met around Michigan uh, are, are keen on in terms of what they like to fish for, some of the fishing contests and things that we have? We have a numerous uh, uh, types of uh, salmon, uh, but two of them, the, the original one was a coho, or silver salmon, which was uh, imported from the, the West Coast. And that was started up at Platte Bay. And then they eventually, uh, Manistee, it was planted there. And then they decided that they wanted to get some larger fish that actually lived a little bit longer. And that was the, the king salmon, or the Chinook. And uh, that, that was planted, and they are a four-year life cycle as opposed to the coho, which doesn't grow quite as large. That's a three-year. They go up the rivers to spawn from the Great Lakes, and uh, they, after they spawn, they die, and, and that's their, their life cycle. And of course, the um, DNR catches some of the uh, spawn from uh, different weirs uh, to uh, help propagate the, the salmon, uh, just there's a lot of uh, natural spawning that uh, the um, and the fish uh, are uh, developed from that but uh, also the DNR uh, helps along with the, uh, the, the different hatcheries and and uh, they plant them in di various different places there's another salmon that was uh, planted uh, it's called a pink salmon and that was incidental planting I think if, if I'm not mistaken by uh, Canada and uh, and that's taken it it it, it uh, developed quite well, but it's mostly in the St. Uh, Mary's River system, and then of course we have the steelhead, uh, which has uh, been around for a long time, and it came back on its own, and they are helped also from time to time by the DNR, but that is a um, that can go up the river and return to the lake. They don't die like the salmon. That's a trout. And that's a trout, right? Yeah, that's a trout. And uh, it's actually a, a variation of the rainbow trout. And there is one up on the, on the wall up there. Well, we'll take a look at all these because I know there's a lot of fish to look at here. And uh, uh, they're, very, they're very beautiful fish. And, you know, you can see their various sizes. And, yeah. Um, so how have, how have conditions changed? Uh, you know, I'm sure you started before 1967 fishing here in, yeah. in Michigan. But... Um, have we overfished, or are are we seeing, you know, ebb and flow? Are we seeing a return of some species, but not others? Well, one of the one of the biggest problems, as I mentioned at the beginning, was the commercial fishing was taking a lot of the lake trout, and uh, they that was what what they were they were targeting. Of course, we didn't have the salmon then, but they were targeting the uh, the lake trout and the whitefish. And the whitefish has never been helped in any way. It just uh, it's a natural fish in in the Great Lakes, and so is the lake trout. And but uh, in addition to the commercial fishing, a, the uh, Welland Canal was opened up, the the St. Lawrence Seaway, and uh, they uh, the, the uh, parasite um, lamprey eel came in, swam up the the system, and attacked the lake trout, particularly the the lake trout. And and uh, they just uh, really between the commercial fishing and the uh, lamprey, the um, uh, lake trout fishery it, it was almost devastated. And uh, finally, they came up with a uh, lamprecide that uh, would help uh, curb the reproduction of the lamprey. And what they do is they put this lamprecide; it's a poison in the streams uh, at headwaters and various streams where they spawn. And that kills uh, the lamprey uh, larva in the mud, and they roll up, and and of course that cuts down the numbers. But uh, it's a, it's a constant maintenance process, and since then uh, the um, sport fishing has developed, and consequently the DNR is planting fish, and and only the Indians can harvest uh, lake trout anymore, but not. But there isn't any gill netting. That was another thing that was cut out altogether. Well, I would imagine a big part of the uh, fishing organization is not just, you know, a club where people can talk about their experiences, but also a way of educating people about how to, how to do it in a safe way and, and, and you know, sharing techniques on, 
on on how to fish well in uh, respect. I mean, when did the when did the term uh, cut you know uh, catch and release really come into into common usage? Was that always kind of a thing that a, a sport fisherman well, would do? Uh, there were there are different degrees of. Uh, catch and uh, release by fishermen I and yeah, some uh, go out to harvest fish and they don't yeah. you know they're not interested in in releasing them but it really is impractical to to release salmon anyhow because eventually they're going to die but now the steelhead that's a that's a that's a trout and that uh, lives for a longer period of time and that in other trout trout uh, are the same like in the streams they do um, uh, a lot of people uh, catch and release. Now there's what they call the holy waters over uh, on the eastern side of the state, the uh, uh, Osabo River, and uh, and there's a section there that uh, nobody keeps any fish. They they just it's just catch and release, and it's mostly all fly fishing, and it's it's a fun thing to do. So for those in the audience who don't know much about um, fishing in Michigan, um, what can you say with your experiences traveling around the state in terms of the variety of fishing areas that we have, that it really is a, a good mixture of, of fishing? Oh, yes. We have uh, walleye, we have perch, we have bluegills, we got bass, we got muscalinge, uh, northern pike, and uh, a variety of uh, rough fish that uh, people catch, like the sheephead, which is a uh, just a nickname for uh, a drum. And uh, but they don't uh, eat those. They do. They uh, guys uh, have uh, sport um, uh, tournaments for just sheephead, and that's just catch and release. Or they might kill them. I don't know. But they don't. Eat, they seldom eat them. Same with the carp. Occasionally, uh, some. Some they, uh, some people go out and uh, spear carp, and uh, they just do it for the sport of it. Okay, well, we're going to be right back, so stay with us on Where Do We Go From Here, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 